Hey everyone, welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about the 20th century American author, John Williams, who has had quite a few swings in popularity over the past 60 odd years, but has been enjoying a bit of a renaissance in the past decade or so, ever since NYRB began republishing his books. If you have heard of him, you've probably heard that he's one of the most neglected and underrated authors of the 20th century, but he wrote this really perfect book called Stoner that you should absolutely read. But John Williams is neither underrated nor obscure, really. It seems like everyone has read Stoner by now. I mean, it has over 150,000 ratings on Goodreads, which is more than James Joyce's Ulysses. And he's clearly not too underrated, as he won the National Book Award for Augustus, indicating that he was, well, quite rated in his day. But John Williams has sort of become one of the poster children for lip bros who want to only read forgotten and neglected and avant-garde artists. Now, I do think that John Williams is an exceptional author who wrote three very good books. But the reason I start this video by talking about his reputation is because I do think that a lot of John Williams fans can be quite overbearing, and that seems to have led a lot of people to now view John Williams as being particularly overrated. Oh, how the pendulum swings. But the main reason that I want to talk about John Williams today is because while Stoner is a good book, a great book even, I see fewer people talking about his other books, which I spent the last month reading. I read Stoner years and years ago, but I never dove into the rest of his catalog. But, and you might not believe me if you've only read Stoner and think that it's a perfect novel, as it's often categorized, as I think I've said before on this channel, Stoner might actually be his worst book, at least compared to his other two notable books, Augustus and Butcher's Crossing, both of which are just wildly good, I think. And so instead of doing two separate videos on those two books, which I read last month and absolutely adored, I figured I would just do a full video on John Williams in which I talk about those two books alongside Stoner and alongside his oft forgotten, kind of for a good reason, book, uh, his debut novel, Nothing But The Night. To start though, just a bit on John Williams himself. He was born in Texas in 1922, he joined the Air Force in 1942, and he earned a PhD in English literature, and continued to teach at various universities across America for most of his life. That is, outside of his time in the Air Force, he lived a pretty similar life to that of William Stoner, the protagonist of Stoner. He was a pretty ordinary academic, all things considered, and his first three books weren't too popular. Stoner, for example, got positive reviews when it first came out, but it only sold like 2,000 copies, which isn't too, too bad, but then it, it went out of print the next year and didn't really resurface until many years later. This is to say that he lived a pretty ordinary life, not particularly poor, not particularly wealthy, not particularly famous, but not wholly obscure. And throughout his career, he wrote four books, each of which vary widely in terms of subject matter. One's a psychological thriller, one's a Western, one's a kind of campus novel, and the last is a historical fiction set in Rome during the early empire. And this is what strikes me as particularly interesting about John Williams, is the subject matter of each of his books vary widely. But in each of the books, he's exploring a lot of the exact same themes. Masculinity, especially that of young men becoming men. Loneliness the uncertainty of one's place in the world, existentialism, the role of art, especially literature in ordinary lives, duty versus freedom, etc. These themes echo across his bibliography, manifesting in new and different ways in each of the different settings of each of his novels. And his prose style throughout is pretty immaculate. His prose is often described as plain and crystal clear, and I think that those are pretty good descriptors. His prose isn't the kind of bare bones Hemingway style, but it's not overly adorned or overly stylized either. It's clear, it's straightforward, and beautiful often. I'm never quite sure how to describe this particular kind of prose style because it's simple and straightforward, but it's deceptively beautiful in that simplicity. I hope you'll get a sense of his prose style uh, later when I read a few extracts. But rather than make claims about his entire bibliography, let's dig into each of his books going in publication order. Though feel free to skip around, of course. And I'll note up front that I'll try my best not to really spoil these books, though revealing the plot wouldn't spoil uh, any of these books. If a book can be spoiled by revealing its plot, it's not a very great book in my opinion. But 
towards the end of each section, I will be talking about the kind of ends of the books uh, as Williams has this brilliant way of ending all of his books in a very reflective way that often sort of embodies all of the themes that this book, that each of the books were trying to get at. So fair warning, feel free to skip some of the quotes. And anyways, on to the books. We begin with a novel that I've seen really almost no one else even mention, besides a few different reviewers on Instagram. Shout out to 11th Volume, who has a very great, very short review of this book, which I'll leave a link to below. But Nothing But the Night was John Williams' debut novel, published in 1948 when he was just 26 or 27 years old. And while I have spoken to a few people who do enjoy this novel and do like this novel, in my opinion, there's a very good reason why so few people even mention this novel. In fact, John Williams himself even kind of like disowned this book, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of people just say that John Williams only wrote three novels. And there's a reason why it's the only NYRB edition of John Williams's books that doesn't include a praising introduction by a notable scholar or writer, and instead includes a pretty interesting uh, interview with John Williams's widow. But their interview doesn't even mention nothing but the night. They just talk about his other books. But anyways, this was the final John Williams book that I read, and it's okay. If it wasn't written by John Williams, I would find it entirely forgettable. But I think it is actually kind of worth reading um, because we see the early manifestations of a lot of his themes that he'll explore much more effectively in his later works. And it's also just interesting to see an author mature as a writer, and he certainly matures quite a bit. Nothing But the Night follows over the course of a single day Arthur Maxley, a 24-year-old young man who is, right from the start, you can tell he's haunted by something in his past. And he's sort of stagnant in life. He's suffering from that kind of ennui that so many young people suffer from when they're trying to figure out what to do with their life and try to, trying to figure out their own place in this world. He's recently dropped out of college and he's just sort of lost. And on the day that we follow him, he's dreading this meeting with his father that he's going to uh, get lunch with. And his father clearly doesn't approve of his lifestyle and their interactions and their relationship sort of make up a, a large portion of this book, I think. As they talk around their shared history, they have, this, they have something in their past that bonds them together, but they refuse to address it directly. It's pretty clearly, it's pretty clear early on in this novel that shared trauma has to do with Maxley's mother. Though we don't know exactly what it is about her, but Maxley's mother haunts this novel. Maxley dreams and daydreams about her and the love and safety that she gave him. And there's something really Proustian in that, in a way, this, this haunting of the maternal figure, the longing for a mother's love and acceptance and, and goodnight kisses. There's probably also something quite Freudian in this as well, but I'll leave that aside for now. So much of this book is a psychological thriller about this mounting dread as this history, this past, begins to emerge. The dread of facing the reality of this trauma, the dread of, of naming it, it keeps popping up again and again in front of his eyes involuntarily, again, very Proustian in a way. And he pushes it back down, but you know from the very start that at some point it's going to, it's going to explode. Regret and the repression of regret simmers. And I won't spoil exactly what it is, but I do want to read the moment that it bursts because I think it's some of the best writing in the novel. Though feel free to skip ahead until the text is off the screen. And then he remembered. He reached across the darkness, pierced the barrier of untrammeled applause, surmounted the obstacle of present sight, remembered and knew why it was that he saw his mother's face in the senseless vapidity of the shape before him, how he saw her calmness in the rapt, challenging ferocity of, of this face. And at the moment of remembrance, he was not half crouching above a table in a hot nightclub, for none of this existed. It was only a nightmare of the present, and suddenly it was gone and he was transported back into his own reality. And I think this is all just really quite interesting how John Williams flips it, how the trauma becomes the reality and the spatial physical reality becomes the real nightmare. This strikes me as a pretty accurate and pretty disturbing uh, description of, of how trauma manifests in one's mind. Like most debut novels though, Nothing But The Night does include 
a bit too much juvenilia for my tastes, especially in the dialogue and in Arthur Maxley's resentment of other people's contentedness. And Arthur's perception of women is pretty odd, and this problem continues throughout all of John Williams' career, up to the last book anyways. To reduce this debut novel to being written by an angsty young man who has daddy issues is probably a bit too reductive. As there is some beautiful sentence level writing and there are a few scenes that are pretty mesmerizing and strike me as examples of the amazing set pieces that exist in his later book, Butcher's Crossing. Maxley watches a, a dance at one point that becomes this like frenetic frenzy of, of untamed energy that is, I think that scene is really quite well written. But this novel is clearly not my favorite. It's a bit too generic and it is rife with the sort of dream sequences that are always in novels about trauma that I really just don't care too much for. It seems to be a very generic example of that kind of trauma horror novel, which tries to pull the rug out from underneath you at the very end in a way that just feels amateurish. That being said, there is some interesting psychological depth to Arthur Maxley that we see pop up again and again throughout the rest of his career, especially in the angsty, uncertain, and unfulfilled young men that proliferate in Williams's entire bibliography. But Arthur's character doesn't crescendo in the way that Stoner does or the way that Will Andrews or Augustus really do. So I think it's worth reading, but really only in relationship to the uh, to Williams' later, much better, much more polished novels that we'll turn to now. Williams' second book, Butcher's Crossing, published in 1960, takes as its main concern the American West. And right off the bat, I will say that this book is up there with Blood Meridian and Oakley Hall's Warlock as one of the best Westerns out there, though to be completely transparent, I haven't read too many of them. It follows a young man named Will Andrews, who sometime in the 1870s drops out of school at Harvard and sets out West in search of, well, for him, life. He desires an idealized wild freedom that can't be obtained or expressed in his opinion, in the cities on the East Coast. He yearns for a life closer to the natural world because he heard a, a, a talk given about uh, Emerson at Harvard, ironically enough. But he drops everything of his privileged life and sets out west, landing in the frontier town called Butcher's Crossing in western Kansas, where he plans to join a group of buffalo hunters and begin hunting buffalo. In town, he meets a businessman named McDonald who tries to recruit Will Andrews to be a sort of clerk, to have a basically normal office job in town. And he tries to dissuade Andrews from joining the Buffalo Hunters because he has seen what it has done to so many of the young men who have come through town. But of course, Andrews refuses. McDonald asks him why he came all the way out here. And I think that this passage really summarizes the sort of idealized vision that Andrews has and that so many Americans had and have of the American West. Mr. McDonald, Andrews said quietly, I appreciate what you're trying to do for me, but I want to try to explain something to you. I came out here, he paused and let his gaze go past McDonald, away from the town, beyond the ridge of earth that he imagined was the riverbank to the flat yellowish green land that faded into the horizon westward. He tried to shape in his mind what he had to say to MacDonald. It was a feeling. It was an urge that he had to speak. But whatever he spoke, he knew would be but another name for the wilderness that he sought. It was a freedom and a goodness, a hope and a vigor that he perceived to underline all the familiar things of his life, which were not free or good or hopeful or vigorous. What he sought was the source and preserver of his world a world which seemed to turn ever in fear away from its source, rather than search it out, as the prairie grass around him sent down its fibered roots into the rich, dark dampness, the wildness, and thereby renewed itself year after year. Suddenly, in the midst of the great flat prairie, unpeopled and mysterious, there came into his mind the image of a Boston street, crowded with carriages and walking men who toiled sluggishly behind the arches of evenly spaced elms that had been made to grow, it seemed, out of the flat stone of sidewalk and roadway. 
there came into his mind the image of tall buildings, packed side by side, the ornately cut stone of which was grimmed by smoke and city filth. There came into his mind the image of the River Charles, winding among plotted fields and villages and towns, carrying the refuse of man and city out to the Great Bay. He became aware that his hands were tightly clenched, the tips of his fingers slipped in the moisture of his palms. He loosened his fists and wiped the palms on his trousers. I came out here to see as much of the country as I can, he said quietly. I want to get to know it. It's something that I have to do. And so, after being scolded for being young and naive by MacDonald in a great speech that uh, I'll leave on screen but I won't read, Andrews hears talk of this guy named Miller who claims to have this secret spot up in the mountains of Colorado where there is a secluded group of buffalo just waiting to be hunted. It's a secluded paradise filled with unsuspecting buffalo just waiting to be conquered. And Miller has been planning this hunt for like a decade. And he is dead set on this dream of going to this spot and hunting the buffaloes. It's all he's been thinking about. And Miller is a fascinating character. He's in many ways the villain of this story, as he's a kind of Ahab figure. He's been planning this hunt for a decade. It's taken over his mind. He isn't quite as much of a megalomaniac as Ahab, but his arrogance and his determination to go and hunt these buffaloes are his most defining feature. When he and Andrews and their company begin traveling towards the, the mountains to go to this, this spot, they keep losing the river. They keep losing their water source. And while everyone else is complaining and begging Miller to turn to go to a nearby frontier town, Miller just continually says, he has this refrain throughout the entire book, I know this country. And like any refrain or like any time anyone is too persistent about something, the more they say it, the more incessant they are with, with saying it, the more you begin to doubt it. And the and both the party in the novel and the reader begin to doubt Miller's incessant insistence that he knows this country. But I find this refrain to just be so interesting because of course what he's talking about is the physical land of the West. But he's also very much talking about the United States as a whole. They talk about the West as if it is a different land, a different country than the one in the East. And in many ways it is. But it's their insistence on the domination of that land that really gets them in trouble. It's like it's a new country to conquer. And if they want to continue to exist, they need to conquer it. I mentioned Blood Meridian earlier, and I think there's a lot of similarities here between Miller's group of hunters and uh, Captain White's gang in Blood Meridian. In their arrogance, in their desire to conquer, in their megalomania. Miller is an Ahab figure, but he's not quite judge-like. But at times he does come close in his quest for dominion. Here, not necessarily over people, but over the land, over nature itself. And of course this book takes place in the 1870s, and so they're living through a time where the land, the natural world, is changing. The romantic cover on this NYRB edition is quite nice as it gets at the romantic notion of nature uh, as sublime. But another cover for this novel could easily be that picture of the mountain of buffalo skulls from 1892. The time in which this book takes place is during that bison extermination, and the world in which this book opens is radically different than the one in which it closes, even if it's only a handful of years, if even that. Even Miller at one point admits, I don't know, it seems as if the country has changed. It seems like everything is different than what it was. The West in Butcher's Crossing is already dying, Will Andrews arrived just a few years too late, as there are buffalo left, but the massive hordes that roamed freely across the Great Plains are more scarce now than ever before. And as a result of that, even a lot of the Native American groups that were in that area have also left. And there's a conspicuous absence of Native Americans in this book, actually. They're only mentioned once or twice, though I do think that it's a purposeful erasure on John Williams' part rather than just neglect. At one point, Miller sees a band of them by a river, but he simply looks at them and says contemptuously, River Indians, Miller said contemptuously. They live on catfish and jackrabbits. They ain't worth shooting anymore. This isn't the world of the Southwest of Blood Meridian. Prophets here are found in 
another genocide, the genocide of the American buffalo. And Williams describes that genocide in great detail. The central scene of this novel is the massive buffalo hunt with Miller's gang, and it's like 40-odd pages of just gorgeous McCarthy-level writing about, beautiful writing about, the most heinous violence. It's beautiful, it's terrible, it's manic, it's disturbed, and most of all, it's just horrific. This is just a short excerpt in which Andrews sort of meditates a little bit on this slaughter. After a while, Andrews began to perceive a rhythm in Miller's slaughter, first with a deliberate slow movement that was a tightening of the arm muscles, a steadying of his head, and a slow squeeze of his hand. Miller would fire his rifle. Then quickly he would eject the still-smoking cartridge and reload. He would study the animal he had shot, and if he saw that it was cleanly hit, his eyes would search among the circling herd for a buffalo that seemed particularly restless. After a few seconds, the wounded animal would stagger and crash to the ground, and then he would shoot again. The whole business seemed to Andrews like a dance, a thunderous minuet created by the wildness that surrounded it. Miller becomes enraptured in this madness, refusing to stop killing. He's a complete megalomaniac by this point, existing only within the slaughter. The dream of the West, the dream of the untapped, untamed wildness, just waiting for men, white men, to come in and seize it, quickly turns into a nightmare. The heinous reality of the slaughter is nothing like the idealized stories of white men taming the land that Andrews has been reading about. Andrews regarded the felled buffalo with some mixture of feeling. On the ground, unmoving, it no longer had that kind of wild dignity and power that he had imputed to it only a few minutes before. And though the body made a huge dark mound on the earth, its size seemed somehow diminished. The shaggy black head was cocked a little to one side, held so by one horn that had fallen upon an unevenness of the ground. The other horn was broken at the tip. The small eyes, half-closed, but still brightly shining in the sun, stared gently ahead. The hooves were surprisingly small, almost delicate, cloven neatly like those of a calf. The thin ankle seemed incapable of having supported the weight of the great animal. The broad, swelling side was covered with scars, some of them so old that the fur had nearly covered it, but others were new and shone flat and dark blue on the flesh. From one nostril, a drop of blood thickened in the sun, and dropped upon the grass. Andrew's naive idealism is shattered as the Emersonian ideals with which he began this journey disintegrate into the bloody corpse of a once majestic buffalo. Andrews himself is transformed in this slaughter as he keeps touching his face. We keep getting these notes that he's rubbing his face, which is of course covered in blood, sweat, and dirt. But he keeps wondering if other people will, will recognize him after all of this, or more importantly, I think, whether he'll recognize himself. Andrews, like most of William's protagonists, is a very understated young man, just trying to find himself. And because of this, he is a rather passive character. There are, again, to extend the similarities, I think there are a lot of similarities between him and the kid from Blood Meridian, as well as Ishmael from, from Moby Dick. But Andrews occasionally fades into the background, and, and Miller really takes center stage, and Andrews is just kind of pulled along. He's never quite as invisible as the kid is in a few different uh, chapters in Blood Meridian, but there's something to be said about how he is dragged along and pulled along by the Emersonian ideals that he learns at Harvard, and then by Miller and his gang out west. It's often unclear exactly how and what Andrews feels about certain events that are happening to him. Like reading The Kid in Blood Meridian, we need to sort of infer emotion based on action. But I think that there's a really good reason for both McCarthy and Williams to have such passive young characters in these books that are so much about the American mythos and ethos. Tens of thousands of completely ordinary young men just like them created this history. They were led by megalomaniacs, but they themselves weren't really. Butcher's Crossing is an elegy for a world destroyed. I can't think of the American West without thinking about that picture of the, the mountain of buffalo skulls, and that's really what this book is all about. How the West was tamed in a way but it was destroyed in that taming by the butchers who crossed into that landscape, seeking profit, or reputation, or just simply wanting to kill. And this westward expansion is 
obviously fundamental to our idea of America and to our idea of Western civilization. And like McCarthy's Blood Meridian, Williams' Butcher's Crossing exposes that myth not as noble, but as savage. This is a really great book, and it's a great deconstruction of American mythology. I do want to read just one more passage from the book that comes quite close to the end, so feel free to skip ahead. But once Andrews comes back from this hunt, he meets up with McDonald again, the kind of clerk businessman in town, and McDonald scolds him. Young people, McDonald said contemptuously. You always think there's something to find out. Yes, sir, Andrews said. Well, there's nothing, McDonald said. You get born and you nurse on lies. You get weaned on lies and you learn fancier lies in school. You live all your life on lies. And then maybe when you're ready to die, it comes to you that there's nothing, nothing but yourself and what you could have done. Only you ain't done it because the lies told you there was something else. Then you know you could have had the world because you're the only one that knows the secret. Only then it's too late. You're too old. No, Andrew said. A vague terror crept from the darkness that surrounded them and tightened his voice. That's not the way it is. You ain't learned then, McDonald said. You ain't learned yet. Look, you spend nearly a year of your life in sweat because you have faith in the dream of a fool. And what have you got? Nothing. You kill three, four thousand buffalo and stack their skins neat. And the buffalo will rot wherever you left them. And the rats will nest in the skins. What have you got to show? A year gone out of your life a busted wagon that a beaver might use to make a dam with, some calluses on your hands, and the memory of a dead man. No, Andrew said. That's, that's not all. That's not all I have. Then what? What have you got? Andrews was silent. I can't recommend this one enough. The ending and the way that the buffalo hunt culminates and really exposes it as a useless fool's errand is, is just brilliant. It is a bit too short, in my opinion, to like fully explore the ideas that it's exploring. But I think that's also just me just wanting this book to be much longer and to uh, it, have it, be able to enjoy it for a longer period of time. But I think that this book is a near perfect triangulation between Blood Meridian, Moby Dick, and Oakley Hall's Warlock. As it, like those three novels, just brilliantly distills the American ethos and mythos. And deconstructs them. It's really, really great. The next book that John Williams published is, of course, Stoner, which is by far the most popular of his books today. I know that this isn't a perfect measurement by any means, but this book has more than 100,000 more ratings on Goodreads than his other three books combined. And honestly, I'd be lying if I didn't say I understand why. I really like Stoner, though I'm going to try to be as brief here as possible because so many other people have already talked about Stoner and so many people have already read Stoner, and I haven't read it in like seven or eight years and seem to have misplaced my notes. But anyways, Stoner was published in 1965 and it is often described as a perfect novel. And this might be true if you ignore the women characters, which is easy to do as there's really only like one of them. Like in Butcher's Crossing, I mean, this is an off-cited critique of Williams. He sucks at writing women characters in his early books in Stoner and in Butcher's Crossing and in Nothing But the Night. Um, he fixes this problem and writes a brilliant woman character in Augustus that we'll talk about in just a second. But there's really no getting around it. It's difficult to ignore, especially if you have read his other books and you start to notice a trend. But I will leave that aside for now, just like everyone who reviews this novel does, uh, who reviews this novel positively does, um, and, and talk about what this book does do well. Because what this book does do well, I think it does exceptionally well. Stoner is the story of a wholly ordinary man born to a farming family in 1891. Growing up, he works on the farm, and when he comes of age, his father encourages him to go to the local university to study agriculture in order to learn more about farming and then come back and support the family business, which he does, or at least the first part of that. When he gets to the university, he takes an English class. And like everyone who becomes an English major who didn't intend to become an English major, after that first class, he just falls in love with literature. Art opens up a new world for Stoner, and once he enters that world, he refuses to leave. He abandons his farming heritage and takes up pre-modern poetry. Maybe there's a reason I like this book so much, as I was reading it while 
landscaping and thinking about going back to graduate school and I did pretty much the exact same thing. But even if you're not an academic, I think a lot of us can still relate to this story of moving beyond the kind of familiar, familial calling into a world that is surrounded by, by literature, by, by, by art. But what makes Stoner such a remarkable book, in my opinion, is that it isn't necessarily about the transcendent value of art or about the extraordinary existence of a man who moved beyond what was familiar to him into the world of capital A art, but it's about the holy ordinariness of it all. Let me just read the opening page because I think it really does a good job of distilling um, and setting up what this book is about and how it's going to go about uh, exploring uh, its major themes. William Stoner entered the University of Missouri as a freshman in the year 1910 at the age of 19. Eight years later, during the height of World War I, he received his Doctor of Philosophy degree and accepted an instructorship at the same university where he taught until his death in 1956. He did not rise above the rank of assistant professor, and few students remember, remembered him with any sharpness after they had taken his courses. When he died, his colleagues made a memorial contribution of a medieval manuscript to the university library. This manuscript may still be found in the rare books collection bearing the inscription presented to the library of the University of Missouri in memory of William Stoner, Department of English, by his colleagues. An occasional student who comes up upon the name may wonder idly who William Stoner was, but he seldom pursues his curiosity beyond a casual question. Stoner's colleagues, who held him in no particular esteem when he was alive, speak of him rarely now. To the older ones, his name is a reminder of the end that awaits them all, and to the younger ones, it is merely a sound which evokes no sense of the past and no identity with which they can associate themselves or their careers. In many ways, then, as you can tell from this opening page, Stoner is remarkable insofar as he is wholly unremarkable. He had little impact on his field of studies, he had little impact on his colleagues and on his students, and in many ways this novel is about failure. But it's a palpably relatable failure. But what makes Stoner such an interesting character is that his failure isn't exceptional and it's not out of the ordinary at all. He's a quiet failure, like so many of us are, neither wholly successful in some of the ways that he wanted to be, nor necessarily an abject failure. He falls into that realm of the mediocre, ordinary, forgettable academic. The realm that honestly a lot of us wish we could fall into because at least that comes with a decent paying job and health insurance. But you can't really be a insubstantial, quiet academic anymore. Anyways, different times. What I find interesting about this novel is that it lowers the engagement of art to an ordinary level. That is, it can be said of William Stoner that he is just an ordinary worker and that this novel is really just about work. It doesn't quite matter that he's a university professor working with these timeless pieces of art. It's not any more nor any less noble than the farm work that his father or his father's father did. They're equally noble in that individual people have dedicated their lives honestly to that kind of work. That's what matters, I think. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many readers who aren't academics still read this novel and fall in love with it. The way he falls in love with literature though is I think universal to all of us who fall in love with literature. Let me just read this passage. It's a popular excerpt but for a good reason. This is happens in the middle of him lecturing and he knows that he's not particularly charismatic when he's lecturing and he often struggles to properly uh, and enthusiastically articulate why he found why he finds certain works of art so profound. But we get this little passage that I think is just great. But during the weeks that Edith was in St. Louis, when he lectured, he now and then found himself so lost in his subject that he became forgetful of his inadequacy, of himself, and even of the students before him. Now and then he became so caught by his, by his enthusiasm that he stuttered, gesticulated, and ignored the lecture notes that usually guided his talks. At first he was disturbed by his outbursts, as if he presumed too f familiarly upon his subject, and he apologized to his students when they began coming up to him after class, and when in their papers they began to show hints of imagination and the revelation of a tentative love. He was encouraged to do what he, he had never been taught to do. The love of literature, of language, of the mystery of the mind and the heart showing themselves in the minute, strange, and unexpected combinations of letters and words, in the blackest and coldest print, 
the love which he had hidden as if it were illicit and dangerous, he began to display, tentatively at first, and then boldly, and then proudly. As a teacher, I really like that because it really just shows how contagious raw enthusiasm for literature can be. This book is tender, I think, and honest, and it's through that honesty that it reveals existential truths about art, about the value of labor, about love, about humanity, as it is, at the end of the day, a book about a wholly ordinary man's life. No more extraordinary than your life or mine. And it is written in a gorgeous prose, or at least I think so. I can see why this book is so popular and why so many readers are drawn to it. It's a great campus novel, and it is a brilliant portrait of a single man. The book begins with his birth and ends, well, where it always ends. While Stoner isn't the most likable man, and he does some pretty terrible things, Williams approaches the depiction of his life in a way that I, I think just resonates with readers, whether they're an academic themselves or whether they've never even been inside of a seminar, but just love reading. The passages about teaching are some of my personal favorites, but the passages about reading, I think, are some of the best. His parents were happy to see him, and they seemed not to resent his decision, but he found that he had nothing to say to them. Already, he realized, he and his parents were becoming strangers, and he felt his love increased by its loss. He returned to Columbia a week earlier than he had intended. He began to resent the time he had, he had to spend at work on the foot farm. Having come to his studies late, he felt the urgency of study. Sometimes, immersed in his books, there would come to him the awareness of all that he did not know, of all that he had not read, and the serenity for which he labored was shattered as he realized the little time he had in life to read so much, to learn what he had to know. If that's not a universal experience, uh, I don't know what is. Well, at least the part about learning about the limits of your reading, not necessarily about your parents becoming strangers. I really like Stoner. I do think that it is a great book, and I like the subject matter a lot. I mean, as um, I'm currently a, an academic who went to uh, university for very similar reasons and left with way too many English degrees, and the politics of the English department in here are, are really interesting because a lot of people think of English departments as these like noble institutions but it's really those petty arguments that control funding, control course allocation, and control all of these things. I don't know. You don't really beat a great campus novel, and I think that this is one of the better campus novels. There's a lot more to be said about Stoner. I barely touched on any of it. I recommend go watching uh, any one of the countless wonderful reviews of Stoner already on YouTube, or if you haven't read it, better yet, go read it. Augustus was, by all measures, John Williams' most successful book when it was published in 1972. It won the National Book Award alongside a novel with, uh, by John Barth, and it was highly lauded, though interestingly enough, it now seems like it's actually his least read, at least of his three main books. And of course, it was John Williams' final book, though he didn't die until 22 years later. In Augustus, Williams also learned how to write women. <laughs> And for my money, the most interesting character of this, of this novel isn't Augustus himself, but his daughter, Julia, from whom we hear from quite a bit. And I'll come back to her in just a second, but the title of this book is Augustus. And what Williams does in this novel is offer an account of the life of the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus. But it's not as straightforward as that. And what I love about what Williams does in this book is he doesn't allow us access to Augustus himself, at least for most of the book. See, this is an epistolary novel, a novel made up entirely of letters, and in this case also of diary entries as well. But until the very end of the book, none of these letters or diaries come from Augustus himself. They're all from other important people who ran in the same socio-political circles that Augustus ran in, ran in. And so while this book is named Augustus, and almost all the letters are in some way or another about Augustus, we don't actually get inside his head until the very end of the book. And I think that this is a very interesting choice because this book is in many ways a study of the times through a character study of Augustus, the most important person in that part of the world at that time. But we almost never see the world through his eyes. Instead, we see him through the eyes of the world. 
Which is, of course, how we understand almost every historical figure, but it makes this character study in a way like particularly intimate because we get to see a kaleidoscopic view of Augustus. We don't just see one side of him, we see dozens of different sides of him from all sorts of different people that we've all heard of. Cicero, Mark Antony, Marcus Agrippa, Marcus Lepidus, lots of Marcuses. But we also hear from Augustus's mother and his stepfather, both of whom don't want Augustus to inherit, Ju inherit Julius Caesar's uh, position, as they know that the political world of Rome is incredibly dangerous. And in fact, Augustus opens just before Julius Caesar is assassinated. He names his nephew, a certain Gaius Octavius, whom I will just refer to as Augustus just for simplicity's sake, his heir. And for much of the first book, this book has three different books, much of the first book we hear from his family members and from different politicians as they try to ad advise him to either take the inheritance or to uh, abandon it. They warn him about how dangerous this position is, and of course Julius Caesar is quickly assassinated. And so much of this book is really about the sociopolitical world around Augustus, as Augustus rises to power and, and rules. We get insights as to how people around Augustus try to control him. And there's an ongoing dialogue in this novel between the kind of private life and the public life of these politicians, as well as things like freedom versus duty. And Augustus really struggles with both of these, as he is simultaneously the most powerful person in that part of the world. But he's also very restricted in what he can do, because if he does anything too rash or too beyond the pale, then that will disrupt the very delicate balance of politics in Rome. And in fact, the very first sentence of this novel uh, comes from the pen of Julius Caesar, who just writes, send the boy to Apollonia. The boy, of course, being Augustus. But from the very, very start then, we see how Augustus is controlled and manipulated, often literally, by the people around him. Again, though, as I noted earlier, we don't really get Augustus's perspective through all of this. We see him moving through Roman politics from afar. And this book reads as very fragmented, as we get all of these different letters from different people, and it's often kind of difficult to keep these people straight, especially because all of them disagree on politics, never mind what to actually do in every situation. And, of course, they disagree about the very reality in which they exist. These different perspectives contradict. They reveal and they hide. And Williams, like, really effectively alters his style to fit each of these different characters. I'm not uh, an expert by any means on, on Latin prose, especially not classical Latin prose, but he seems to mimic Latin prose quite effectively, especially that kind of prose that is used by Roman aristocrats at the time. And so, I mean, this book really reads like you're, you're searching the archives, picking up individual scraps of letters that reveal something that's interesting, but it also hides something else. And so you need to put all of these scraps together and create a collage. And I mean, that's really how we need to study history, right? Reading history is never objective. It's always reading a series of subjective fragments that the reader really needs to put together to create some sort of narrative, some sort of unified whole. And I just love novels like this, novels that are decentered, novels that embrace contradiction and contrariness and subjectivity, as that's what the history that's what the study of history is, or at least should be. Some historians think that you can achieve objectivity, but there is no objectivity. That's a myth created by someone's own subjectivity. <laughs> And if you want to get even close to objectivity, what you need to do is take in a whole bunch of different perspectives. And Augustus does this by placing in the middle on a pedestal a single man, one of the most famous people of all time, and a person who was, in his own time, essentially a semi-divine god-man. And instead of simply gazing upon him or putting us inside of his head, Williams has us gaze upon him from all of these different angles, hearing every single rumor and fact about him from all of these different people before in the last book, in the final like 40 pages of this novel, finally putting us inside of his own head as he reflects upon all of this. And I think that that is just such a brilliant way of telling a historical fiction novel and a way that I, I wish more authors would would use. Before I talk about that final third of the novel, though, I want to talk about a character who is, in many ways, more central than Augustus himself. And that is his only biological child, uh, his daughter, Julia. The almost cold distance that we have from Augustus is contrasted by the 
very intimate, close and personal relationship that we have with Julia as what we're reading uh, by Julia are her diary entries. That is, we have the most access to her. They aren't, we aren't reading uh, letters that are meant to be sent out to different people, but her very personal, very reflective diaries. And there's a part of me that wishes that this book was simply called Julia and that the whole book was from Julia's perspective as she is such a fascinating character. And she is, in so many different ways, really our central, our core narrator, at least for most of the book. And her story is really quite tragic, and I'll, I won't spoil it all here, but she navigates this patriarchal world in so many different interesting ways, most notably and most uh, importantly plot-wise, um, by embracing her sexuality much to the dismay of her father and the Roman aristocracy. And because of this, Julia is scorned by her father. She is exiled by her father to the small island of Pantateria, where she is required to essentially stay with a few servants um, and never even see a man again in her life. And it's on this island of Pantateria where she writes all of these, all of these diary entries and so this, ex this exile is pretty brutal, but it's not execution, of course. And it's unclear if Augustus actually wanted to exile her, if he personally scorned her, or if it, were if it was really the social forces around him that forced him to act in this way. And Julia herself can't really figure this out, and she ponders it quite a bit. And the way she writes about her relationship with her father is just fascinating, and it's one of it's one of the best uh, father-daughter relationships I've read about in a very long time, at least in terms of uh, how carefully wrought and emotionally uh, full their relationship is. But this exile, this scorning of his daughter, this is really, I think, the emotional crux of this entire novel. And it's really not even just the emotional crux of this novel. It's the crux of the entire novel. Augustus isn't about how Augustus arose to power, solidified his control, and, and ruled over, you know, the, one of the greatest empires that the world has ever seen. Instead, what it's really about is a man who was forced by social pressures to exile his own daughter, whom he loved deeply and whose name he never even speaks again, and how both he and she are haunted and broken by this decision, and how that decision plagues them for the rest of their lives. It's about how Augustus's duty to Rome overrode his duty to his family, and the tragedy of that dichotomy built into a man whom we would think has all the freedom of the world, as he is literally the most powerful person in that part of the world. Julia's diary entries are, for the most part, written much later than the action of than most of the action of the book, as she is writing them um, in Pandateria around the year 4 AD. And she provides a very reflective and very retrospective view on most of the action of this novel. And it's also a kind of distant point of view in that she is not in Rome, and so she is kind of outside of these these political spheres that all the other characters are are moving through. And she spends a lot of the time recounting her love life, her happy marriage, and her later unhappy marriages. And through these accounts, we really see a very different uh, perspective of this male-dominated world. And we see how differently she has to move throughout this world than all of the other male counterparts. Since she was Augustus's only biological uh, child, she was very highly educated, and Augustus, as, as she was younger, Augustus loved her very, very much. But we slowly learn through Julia's diaries that while Augustus loved her deeply, that love became secondary to their relationship because she is Augustus's only biological child. And so what became primary was how Augustus needed to use her politically in order to solidify his rule. After telling her that she needs to marry uh, Tiberius Nero, she responds, So I am once again to be the brood sow for the pleasure of Rome. And then just further in that conversation, she, she asks Augustus, Father, I asked, has it been worth it, your authority, this Rome that you have saved, this Rome that you have built? Has it been worth all that you have had to do? My father looked at me for a long time. And then he looked away. I must believe that it has, he said. We both must believe that it has. 
And this is really the great conflict in both of their lives. Their duty to each other is overridden by their duty to the state. Each of them serve the state in different ways according to their gender and their station, of course. But the great tragedy of this novel and of their relationship is how the duty, their duty to their state must come first. And Williams knows how history will deal with Julia and Augustus differently. And unlike the previous books where the women characters are like really poorly written, here Julia is exceptionally well wrought. She's easily the most sympathetic character in the entire novel. And she knows that she will be forgotten, unlike her father Augustus. History will neglect her role in all of this. They'll, it'll neglect her actions, her beliefs, her affairs. And she writes at one point, If history will remember me at all, history will remember me so. But history will not know the truth, if history ever can. By having Julia as the central narrator, though, William sort of reverses this. She isn't forgotten. Her point of view isn't forgotten. Instead, her point of view is the most important point of view in the entire novel, as it's the one that we get the most. And it's her words that really narrativize so much of Augustus's life and so much of the world of Rome that is typically dominated by men. Outside of Julia's diaries, though, it's really the final third of this book that really shines. The final book is a letter from Augustus to his old friend Nicholas of Damascus. And it's only here in the final 40 or so pages of this novel that we finally get inside the head of Augustus and see the world through his eyes. By this point, we have in our mind a massive collage image of what he's actually like. But it's not until now that again, we get to sit down and, and hear his his point of view of his own life. While he's writing this letter, Augustus is more or less alone on a ship with just a doctor nearby who is looking after his, his health. Augustus was very sickly throughout his entire life. But as you read this, you get the sense that Augustus knows that his end is near. I think he's like 76 years old at this point. It's the first time that we read his thoughts and what thoughts they are. It's just this magisterial like recollection of, of life on his rise to power, on living in this political world, on his relationship with, with his daughter and with Rome, and of course on his impending death. In my opinion is probably the best piece of writing that Williams ever wrote and it really stands as an encapsulation of all of the other themes uh, and ideas that he explored in his previous novels, I think. There's a moment towards the end when Augustus is considering history, and he's also considering the great poets that he loves so much, including Virgil, from whom, of course, we know so much about Augustus because uh, the Aeneid is dedicated to Augustus. But he's considering the role of the poet in the construction of history. And when reading this, I really couldn't help but consider John Williams's role and the role of authors like him, as he was no doubt considering his own role when he wrote this. The poet contemplates the chaos of experience, the confusion of accident, and the incomprehensible realms of possibility, which is to say the world in which we all so intimately live that few of us take the trouble to examine it. The fruits of that contemplation are the discovery or the invention of some small principles of harmony and order that may be isolated from that disorder which obscures it, and the subjection of that discovery to those poetic laws which at last make it possible. No general ever more carefully exercises his troops in their intricate formations than does the poet dispose his words to the rigorous necessity of meter. No consul more shrewdly aligns this faction against that in order to achieve his end than a poet who balances one line with another in order to display his truth. And no emperor ever so carefully organizes the disparate parts of the world that he rules so that they will constitute a whole than does the poet dispose the details of his poem so that another world, perhaps more real than the one that we so precariously inhabit, will spin in the universe of men's minds. It was my destiny to change the world, I said earlier. Perhaps I should have said that the world was my poem, that I undertook the task of ordering its parts into a whole, subordinating this faction to that, and adorning it with those graces appropriate to its worth. And yet, if it is a poem that I have fashioned, it is one that will not for very long outlive its time. When Virgil died, he earnestly beseeched me to destroy his great poem. It was not complete, he said, and imperfect. Like a general who sees a legion destroyed and does not know 
that two others have triumphed. He thought himself to be a failure. And yet his poem upon the founding of Rome will no doubt outlast Rome itself. And certainly it will outlast the poor thing that I have put together. I did not destroy the poem. I do not believe that Virgil thought I would. Time will destroy Rome. I mean, come on. It doesn't really get too much better than that. Augustus is a study of historiography and of how poets create history. And you don't really get a much better study than that study than Augustus, the guy who probably commissioned Virgil himself to write the Aeneid. And the man who is either depicted as a bloodthirsty killer or a bringer of peace, depending which of his own contemporaries and which modern historians you ask. This multiplicity of interpretive frameworks is best applied to historical characters like Augustus, as they, like modern politicians, often either draw scorn or praise and really nothing in between. But I think that this multiplicity can extend back to John Williams' other subjects as well. And I think that comparing Augustus to Stoner is quite interesting, as Stoner is about a wholly ordinary man, and Augustus is about well, one of the great men of history. The great man of history, if there ever was one. Both stories more or less begin with their birth, and both stories more or less end with their death. But both men are drawn with just such tenderness. And each portrait is so careful and humanizing that it seems like the distance between such men for John Williams really isn't much at all. They're both products of their time, and they're both worthy of novels depicting their lives. There's profundity, I think, in reading these two novels side by side, Augustus and Stoner, because they're both character studies, but both of their characters are on opposite ends of the spectrum as to who history will remember. But both characters are treated with the exact same amount of dignity and humanity. It's a real shame that Williams stopped writing after Augustus. Apparently he did work on another novel, but he never published. He died in 1994, leaving behind an enviable bibliography to be sure, but it is sad that he never published another novel after the massive high note that was Augustus. In terms of recommendations and where to start, I really don't think that there's one perfect starting point here. I think it's actually a quite easy recommendation to make. Pick the book that sounds the most interesting to you, which is always my recommendation when talking about a, a specific author. But I think Williams makes your job a little bit easier because he wrote three books that are very, very different, at least in terms of subject matter. But I will say that if you've only read Stoner or if you, pick, if you start with Stoner, please do not stop with Stoner. Do not sleep on Butcher's Crossing and Augustus. They're both really, really good. And in fact, if it's not clear already, what I really recommend doing is reading his entire bibliography. I mean, he only wrote four books, really only three books that you need to read. So reading his complete works isn't that difficult. None of his books are exceptionally long either. And I think that reading his entire bibliography is actually quite interesting as you see the same themes arise again and again, whether it's in the guise of an American buffalo hunter, a university professor, or the emperor of Rome. And I think seeing the similarities between these three characters and these three theaters really shows Williams' accomplishments. Because what he does in each theater is bring dignity and humanity to his protagonists. And by doing so, he makes these seemingly disparate characters universal as they struggle with the exact same realities and emotions that we still struggle with today. And it's really in that struggle, I think, that John Williams's protagonists find their dignity and their humanity. Many of his characters share similar traits. Chief among them, I think, is that that kind of naive idealism of youth that is slowly broken and shattered in their respective self-discovery quests. As always, there's a ton more to be said about each of these books, especially, I think, Augustus and Butcher's Crossing, which are woefully underread, both of which has certainly benefited from the Williams Renaissance that we're sort of still experiencing, but not to the level of stoner and not to the level that they deserve. But I'd love to know your thoughts on John Williams. Again, it doesn't look like his Renaissance is waning anytime soon, which is fine with me, so long as people remember that he wrote more than just stoner.
I really think that John Williams is a, an American master of fiction, but I would love to know your thoughts and your experiences of reading him. But for now, thanks for watching.